Uh, I'm going to be giving my senior lecture and we're going to get there. We're just going to have a little bit of a digression first. Do not worry, there are cute dog photos at the end of this, so just bear with. So this sto a story of how some of this thinking started actually started in the SICU in February of 2020. It, obviously, I was enjoying my peak SICU wellness. I was getting out early every day. All of our patients were easy to dispo. Everyone is in a great mood all the time, just like every SICU ever. Um, while I was there, I had a patient who quite unfortunately had a pretty significant subarachnoid hemorrhage. She uh, needed a central line for 3% saline. I was having a pretty tough time figuring out how am I gonna put in a central line in someone where I want them in Dellenberg for a central line uh, to prevent air embolism to engorge at IJ, but ideally they're gonna have had a bed 30 degrees. So Dr. Budarakis comes by and Dr. Budarakis is wearing swim goggles and N95 and a full bunny suit. We have a great long discussion about how to place a central line, how to quickly do this or that to minimize the ICP, but still get the central line in safely. And at the end of it, I say, I'm really glad that you took the time to talk to me for all of, for what felt like half an hour. And he said, don't you worry, just you wait, just wait for three weeks. Three weeks later, you all know what happens in March, 2020. Um, my time in SICU was uh, pretty, uh, pretty hairy, honestly. Uh, but I was hairy pretty much everywhere in healthcare, everywhere in New York City. Um, honestly, at least I had a job, at least I didn't have to worry about where my next paycheck was coming from. Um, but the significant thing was that the way that Budaraka saw what was coming and was already mentally prepared for it before other people, I thought was really impressive. And I thought was something that we probably need more of because while COVID is the first big disaster in my life that I had to deal with, it may not be the last. Um, as we watched the rest of the world uh, try to deal with the COVID pandemic, um, a lot of folks did a lot better than we did. I watched as we tried to flatten the curve. Unfortunately, flattening it along the Y axis it doesn't really count. Um, however, it does make for some sick memes. Uh, so we, uh, there was another little bit of a wave, but thankfully in New York, after that initial wave, we were ready for all that came next. Uh, but it made me think about another curve that we have been known about for longer that we should have at probably put more effort into flattening as well. And that brings me to, oh, I'm sorry, can you help me out? That brings me to UCSD where um, in addition to being beautiful, it also has the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. This is probably uh, the number one climatological institute in the world, depending on who you ask, obviously I'm biased. I only minored in environmental systems. I'm not actually a professional climate scientist, but they are the ones who came out with this thing called the Keeling Curve. You guys may have seen this before. You all know the concept. Obviously, carbon dioxide is rising. Um, I don't think that's really surprising anyone in the room. There's this fun little seasonal variation because there is uh, increased uptake of CO2 in the Northern Hemisphere during the summer, which causes a decrease, you can see. Um, what, but isn't there a season in both sides of the planet? There's more land in the Northern Hemisphere, so therefore more CO2 absorption. So that explains that. Uh, going right along with that, we know that global temperature is going up. This isn't really up for debate anymore. Uh, there are seasonal, there are variations that range from about 10 to 100,000 years called Milankovitch cycles. They are way longer than what we're dealing with here. Which, unfortunately, after seeing this, every time I thought, man, this is the hottest summer of my life, the back of my brain said, it's the hottest summer of your life so far. <laughs> The logical extension of this, if you map it out to about 80 years from now, according to a prediction in 2009, looks like this. This is the world in 2099. Couple of key things to note here, uh, just for the legend, uh, the yellow is uninhabitable desert. The brown is uninhabitable due to floods, drought, or extreme weather. The green, there's some, re some potential for reforestation. I couldn't figure out why the Sahel, the green area under those, um, so the, um, uh, right between the Sahara and Sub-Saharan Africa, why that is so reforestable. Um, but I'm sure someone smarter than me has thought about it. Um, there's a lot of new green livable land, interestingly. Um, and a couple of things to note about this one, uh, this was published in the New Scientist with a collaboration between the New Scientist and a couple of uh, high level environmental scientists in England. Uh, they were very optimistic because they thought that we'd be able to wire up the whole world with solar, geothermal, and wind energy. 
uh, with a whole lot of conducting subsystems that would keep the rest of society alive. Um, some people predict that this involves 90% of humanity perishing with population regrowth after that, that probably comes to about 3 billion of people living in this map. Um, this map is from 2009. So unfortunately, all of the predictions we've seen have been worse from what this map was. Unfortunately, we are only getting more and more pessimistic. Um, and finally, there are different maps floating around, but climate patterns are very hard to predict because they have a lot of positive feedback loops. If you have negative feedback loops, that gives you homeostasis predictability. That's how you have a function or organism that doesn't die. Um, meanwhile, in climatology, unfortunately, uh, it's quite a, it can be quite a bit more complicated because it's not one organism, it's just a bunch of chemical reactions bouncing off of each other. A couple of highlights. This, we have uh, China, India, and Indonesia, the number one, two, and four populated countries in the planet. This is about four, uh, I'm sorry, three billion people uh, in this part of the map. Um, you can see uh, that this is not exactly a place that's suitable for three billion people to live in this map. Uh, here's a map of the Amazon or what used to be the Amazon. It's now either desert or an area that could be a combination of storming, flooding, or drought. The US um, quite optimistically is pretty wired up here. The dark brown is geothermal, the light blue is solar. And Western Antarctica is a new place to live. Um, it's probably got really cheap real estate except for all of these largely international agreements. But if I can get a real estate deed there, I will let you know. How do you, I'm, I'm sorry, what was that? I know, I'm saying it in the property. Oh yeah, you know, it's, I mean, you can't buy anywhere else, right? So how do we prepare for this? Well, you know, I don't know, gosh. Um, I only dabbled in some of that like eco hippie stuff. Uh, but what I did do a lot of was I went to medical school and residency and I also ran topic reviews. So I felt like we could get some revenge for all of those PGY2s who in the hardest years of, or in the hardest year of residency, had me emailing them saying, and Dr. Gernsheimer, uh, very nicely asking, hey, would you like to make a bunch of slides and ask a bunch of questions while you're on night shifts or in SICU or in NICU or somewhere else? Um, so today we're going to do a little bit of climate change and human health as a topic review sort of format with a little bit of climate science thrown in. So hyperthermia, this one's pretty obvious. You guys all know the connection. 78 year old gentleman comes in after a heat wave with AMS and generalized weakness. Core temperature is 108.2. Hurry 106, he's obtunded. While you're preparing to intubate, which med do you avoid? Um, I'm gonna call out, I know there's only a small audience here. A, vecuronium, B, succinylcholine, C, ketamine, D, presidex. Very good. The answer is sucks because if you get hyperthermic, you can, you can get hyper K. There's also the rare but pretty devastating complication of malignant hyperthermia. This is about the last person you'd want it to happen in. Um, Talking about heat waves in San Francisco in 2017, I was there for the hottest day in San Francisco history. I was there on an away rotation at a UCSF uh, ED uh, away rotation slub shot. Um, the, we, it was the busiest uh, med student shift of my life and potentially one of the busiest shifts of my life. Uh, we intubated seven people. We had a patient with fit, troponin of 50 with clean coronaries. Um, the, it was the record and it actually does stand to the record today. Um, and there's kind of an important lesson here, which is that San Francisco is a cool city. It's, I mean, it's fun to hang out in, but it is also not a city that gets very hot. 160 degrees is no big deal in Arizona and in New York, we'd probably deal with it because everyone in New York City has air conditioning. Um, the reason why there was more of a health impact is because people weren't prepared for it. The other fun California uh, heat story is of course the wildfires that happen every year that rained my parents' house in ash that caused me to have get closed out of school for a week. Um, unfortunately, only increasing in size, number, severity. Um, this is just data going along with uh, heat wave frequency and duration, uh, length of season and the intensity um, in the US, all of it's going up. Uh, India and Pakistan are currently in the middle of their worst heat wave to date. Uh, the highest temperature I saw was 122 degrees in Pakistan, 118 degrees uh, in India. I apologize, I don't remember the exact locations. Um, this has reduced the amount of wheat that India produced this year by 20% from last year, even while they were trying to export uh, because of the shortage caused by the war in Ukraine. Um, just is a great example of different systems bouncing off of each other. The, 
For example, a glacial lake in the Hunter Valley caused flooding, causing destruction of a bridge and five deaths and some destruction of other infrastructure. There are widespread electricity shortages because everyone was living off of air conditioning because not having air conditioning meant death. Would this require shut, shutting down some industrial power output to allow for more power to go to cooling specifically? Um, several passenger trains had to be co-opted in order to take coal from um, from the source of the coal to deliver to the power generation. Um, and all of that increased power consumption and coal consumption, of course, causes worsening air pollution. Um, now imagine, um, as many people, disaster specialists try to do, about what if those are trains are supposed to be carrying medical supplies you need, or what if that electricity powers your hospital? Um, I, it's really impossible to predict how logistic challenges are going to affect us. But if you think about medication shortages you had during COVID or contract shortages you have now, um, that might, there, there are people who would argue that, that we have some more of those to come. This brings us to flooding. Um, when evacuating a flooded home during a storm, a 45 year old's leg is crushed under debris for 20 minutes. Right leg is immersed, immersed in brackish salt water during that time what should be used for antibiotic prophylaxis? In case you can't tell, this is an open fracture. Um, and how many answers do we have for A, Clinda plus Jen? Answer B, Ceftriaxone flagell? Answer C, Meropenem? Or D, Peptasa plus Doxy? And that's it. So um, what you're going for here is in fresh water, you're trying to treat um, Aeromonas, which is related to pseudomonas, you need pseudomonas coverage. In salt water, you need the aeromonas coverage plus doxycycline because they're trying to cover Vibro vulnificus. This is a bacteria that is, it has a 30% mortality rate at 24 hours and a 100% mortality at 72 hours if untreated. So it's not, it is a step one question, yes, but it is also extremely lethal. Just one fun fact about sea level rise, a lot of people get wrong is that it has if anything, it's at least an equal of maybe not slightly more amount of that rise is actually from thermal expansion. It's not just the Antarctic and a bunch of penguins getting tossed into the ocean. There's a little bit of melt from the land too, but that's definitely a lesser contributor. I don't think I really have to explain how New York gets affected by this, um, but it's only going to get worse. We're going to get more flooding. There are some plans to build seawalls, um, and New York is actually pretty progressive as far as a climate um, infrastructure goes. It is working on it. Um, unfortunately, uh, Bangladesh has been getting rocked by floods for years. Um, this was, you know, I didn't even know that they had actually been having the worst flood that they've ever had in April of this year, um, which is actually still ongoing. About 202 million people were trapped. Um, it's an important thing for us to think about what it might be like to do medicine here or what it might be like to try to evacuate people from here um, or what it's like to store food here because this is no longer at a scale where um, it, it's no longer at a scale where it's very easy to move people around. It's going to require something different or just evacuation of that area. Those floods are just going to come back. If you have floods, you're getting mosquitoes. 23-year-old male presents to your emergency room in the August of a rainy summer. Got a retroorbital headache, severe myalgias, malaise, and fever. Um, when doing the exam, you notice petechiae below the blood pressure cuff. You got a hematocrit of 51% and thrombocytopenia. What's your diagnosis? We've got A is dengue fever, B is chikungunya, C is yellow fever, and D is malaria. And I'm sorry, oh, and th this one is in fact dengue fever. This is a nice old step one table of all the differentiating features, um, but this is a lot to learn. Thankfully, there's a little bit of similarity. Thankfully, they do at least have a couple of distinguishing features, uh, but man, am I glad that I don't have to know this every single day. Um, you know, you can dengue is your bone break fever. So by comparison, chicken is your almost like your uh, joint break fever. It's got a little bit more uh, synovitis and symmetrical arthritis. Um, yellow fever gives it away with a jaundice and Zika is kind of the new kid on the block, but it's maybe a little less lethal, maybe associated with this flaccid paralysis is either Guillain-Barre or something else. But um, those are headed our way. These are our fun friends who are coming to join us. Um, Anopheles being malaria, uh, the 80 species carrying most of the rest of them and Culex carrying West Nile virus specifically. 
Um, if you are worried whether or not you're gonna have to know this, um, just wait 30 years and then you can buy an ID textbook uh, because it'll be about 50% of the world population that's exposed to it. There was recently a flare of chicken, or not recently, but in the past several years, there was a flare of chikungunya in Europe um, and everyone is expecting the cases to start marching north. Uh, don't forget about all of the other viruses that are here, all of these ones that you're gonna have to know. Oh no, so many complicated things. I was able to find a review paper that uh, collected together models of every single one of these diseases spreading further. Um, the only good side is that the one model for onchocerciasis, which is river blindness, thankfully is going to decrease in distribution, but it's only one model, so we'll see what happens. Also, in case you like brown recluses, um, don't worry, they're spreading too. The best way to get sick is to have malnutrition. There are many, there are probably more people with malnutrition than what you would call a classic immunodeficiency. So speaking of that, oh, I'm sorry, that one got spoiled. A seven year old male comes in with short stature and frequent infections coming in for lesions on eyes and arms. Vision is 20 to 40 and does not correct with lenses. Um, you walk him through a dark room and he starts running into the furniture. This is a pretty easy vitamin A deficiency. Um, unfortunately, uh, micronutrients are going to start being decreased in global crops. Um, the rice is probably the one that's the most studied, but there's a lot of experiments growing these in artificial environments. You turn up the CO2 and you think, oh, wow, more CO2. Plants love that. Yay. Um, unfortunately, there are other problems that happen. It just changes how the entire plant works. It's kind of like hooking you up into 100% oxygen room forever or living in a hyperbaric chamber. It's not good for you because um, your body's just used to a different standard of living. Uh, protein, iron, zinc, vitamin A, B1, B2, 5, and 9 were all found to decrease depending on what you're looking at. Paradoxically, a couple of things increased in vitamin E, which I think is really good for your skin. So hopefully that pans out because um, my breaking out. Uh, however, for everyone else in the world, including the 2 billion people in the world who have iron deficiency, this is probably going to be a problem, including the fact that we see plenty of iron deficiency here in our developed country. Um, as far as reduced macronutrient yields, this one is a pretty simple, just look at this land and tell me how much crops, how much in the way of crops you can grow on it. Um, and say, uh, think about like what that might mean for a population of 7 billion who might now no longer be able to be 7 billion. Um, if you are going to have massive crop failures, you're probably going to start having refugees. Uh, in a migrant detention camp on the U.S. border, a four-year-old child is forcibly separated from his mother and never reunited with her. Assuming that this qualifies as an adverse childhood event, which of these lab values is most likely to be elevated for the rest of this patient's life? A, thyroid stimulating hormone. C, C-reactive protein. C, vitamin D level. D, platelet count. The answer is... CRP. Um, this is a slight bit of a tangent until it's not when you just realize the science of what happens when you brutalize human beings. Um, the ACEs study is, stands for the Adverse Childhood Events Study. Uh, the original study was done by a gentleman named by Dr. Felitti in 2002. There is a phenomenal uh, physician named Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Um, she was working on this quite a bit before she was made the first Surgeon General of California. She unfortunately just recently resigned for personal reasons, but um, was a great Surgeon General of California and the first one of California. Um, and she did a lot of work in implement in looking at the adverse childhood events that happen in children and connecting the dots between the biology of what happens with a lot of pretty deep research with epigenetics um, and things like, for example, persistently elevated CRPs where you could take the number of adverse childhood events someone had, correlate it with that, that with their CRP, and finally start connecting the dots of what we all know, which is that if you have a stressful life, it tears you apart at a molecular level. We're starting to get closer with that, and what she was doing was designing specific interventions. Um, Yes, of course, if you have an, a high A score, you're going to be twice as likely to smoke, seven times more likely to be an alcoholic, more likely to have cancer or heart disease. Um, but even if you have a score, if you have a score of seven or higher, um, you have a 360% chance increase of having heart disease or of have a specifically ischemic heart disease. Um, that is even for people who are behaviorally uh, matched, meaning no smoking, no drinking, not obese. Um, so unfortunately, you know, the science is pretty well nailed down in a lot of medicine, but hopefully this leads to specific interventions saying your A score is this, and maybe it's because of this. So we have specific interventions talking about like maybe this medication or this like biofeedback or insight oriented therapy. Um, 
So she's pushing the boundaries of that. Uh, unfortunately, in the this is something that you need at least a little bit of resources to pull off. So if you start doing this to millions and millions of refugees, um, this is just an economy of scale. Uh, you're going to cause a lot of health problems in people. There's a reason why if you ever look at people who have climate plans, they talk about psychiatric health. I kept thinking the science of science in my little nerd brain, but there's a reason why people keep coming back to it. Um, uh, there is a uh, phenomenal survivors of torture clinic out of Bellevue, uh, who, if you guys ever get the chance to work with them, you should. Um, it was a really interesting part of my med school experience. <sighs> Climate barbarism is the maladaptive response. When I'm talking about, you can think about what you would like to do, but it is entirely possible that you might decide not to be a good person. And that is what many people are in fact, consciously or subconsciously or unconsciously deciding to do at this very moment in time. Climate barbarism, this is um, the uh, bottom left is, um, sorry, I'm medicalizing. Uh, yeah, met, the bottom left from my perspective is a uh, migrant, or it's, I apologize, a refugee camp on the Mexican border. And the top right is one off of the coast of Australia. Um, Australia has also been doing this for years. The many, many, many refugees they have coming in off of the Pacific where they have a mandatory detention period. Um, and their main goal is to keep people out. Uh, Naomi Klein is the woman in the bottom right. Uh, she's a phenomenal author. She's been talking about lots and lots of different issues in the world, but she's really started to narrow down on climate as a big one. Um, she specifically mentions things like, for example, the shooting in Christchurch, New Zealand, when a gentleman of Australian origin went into a mosque and shot over 50 Muslim uh, folks, uh, many of whom were immigrants, specifically described the future of increasing refugees, climate disruption becoming a lived reality, and um, and described himself as an ethno-nationalist eco-fascist, saying that um, the burden of refugees was going to be too much and was going to start to impose on the uh, quality of life of uh, those in the quote-unquote first world. Um, he described it as part of a great replacement theory, which is a theory that you probably are hearing bouncing around in the news every now and then. Um, this was specifically mentioned by the El Paso shooter who walked into a Walmart and shot, I believe it was 14 people. It's so hard to keep track of all these shootings. Um, at a Walmart, he specifically alluded to the Christchurch shooting. And he said that the quality of life at Walmart was too much for everyone in the world to live with. So it had to be reserved for people like Americans, and it was in fact mentioned that yes, it was white Americans. Um, he apparently did not know that Mexico also has Walmarts, um, but that part of this is the, that these are the sharpest manifestations of the kind of philosophy that would take money away from FEMA and put it towards ICE. The philosophy that would say that your climate is getting worse because of things that you did that you've been benefiting from and that you're isolated from by your higher latitude. So now you're going to, um, instead of trying to do some kind of restorative justice, you're going to try to in fact, um, fortress your country, keep people out and not care about what happens to them. The, if, Everything I'm saying isn't getting through. The Pentagon um, has been predicting that climate change is gonna be a major source of uh, not only refugees, instability, drought, famine, but also just of civil conflict. Um, in the Syria had been having a drought since 1998, but in 2006, um, things started to get real. In 2007, the Pentagon came out with a report predicting war in Syria, saying that um, climate change specifically was going to exacerbate conditions causing Syria to likely erupt in a civil war based on sectarian violence, based off of the fact that there's multiple different groups of people there who aren't all best friends, uh, who would tolerate each other if they weren't running out of water. But they were, there were, um, by 2010, there are 3 million Syrians who are living in extreme poverty. 20% of the Syrian population was internally displaced because 1.5 million of those three were displaced farmers who um, were trying to go to cities because they could no longer grow crops. Um, in 2011, um, villages that were less sympathetic to Assad um, got their tap turned off. There are obviously many, many, many other components to this. The Syrian civil war started and water became a frequent target of uh, military attacks and control. So how are we feeling after all of that? I'm, there were many times when I was doing this that I had to take a break because I felt like this. 
This is, by the way, a viscacha. This is the face I make sometimes when I'm having a bad day. Um, this is not an easy thing to talk about. So we're gonna include a little dog therapy. This is Anto and Nala. There are two dogs that I spent a very lovely part of residency taking care of. They would stay at our house for weeks at a time. They're absolute little monsters. Um, this is one of the few times you're eating my food where they were invited to. So we are gonna start talking about the five stages of grief. We're gonna talk about denial, which is, I think most of us are past. Um, I still have my internal little moments of it where I wonder, is this really happening? I really wish it wasn't. Anger is a pretty common response. Um, that can be anger at the people who are trying to challenge your views, or it can be in saying that climate change exists. I hope that the room isn't full of those people. Or it could be the anger of why is this happening? How did no one pick up on this? Why am I born into this? And why is, you know, why am I, why is there a reasonable chance that my future is going to look like a less pleasant and less easy time than my past? Bargaining is probably where a lot of central, like maybe where if you had a colleague, so-called center of the country, we all sort of know it's coming, but we're wondering how much can we get away with? Can we still have our very nice life? Um, can we still like look for, oh, can we, can we keep going on with business as usual? Um, this is not just, I don't think this is just a psych, like a individual phenomenon, but I'm pretty sure this is pretty much how, um, modern uh, policy is being oriented uh, in actuality, not in statements where people say that we have to do a lot because the reality is different. Depression is probably where a lot of our generation is because we've been looking at this problem a little bit harder than um, potentially than anyone else. I, I, it's a commonly cited reason for depression and mental illness um, as to what, you know, why they might not be super excited about everything. I'm sorry, raised, someone raising their hand? Before we get to the final part, there is this one note on what I would call the transition before we get to the end, which is on pain, uh, which conveniently happens to be the title of a poem by this gentleman named Khalil Gibran, who I really, really like. Um, I have his, all of his poetry is available online for free. Um, but in the book, The Prophet, there's this intro, um, or in the intro to this poem on pain, starts with, your pain is a breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. Even as a stone of the fruit must break, that its heart may stand in the sun, so must you know pain. And could you keep your heart in wonder at the daily miracles of your life? Your pain would not seem less wondrous in your joy. And you would accept the seasons of your heart, even as you have always accepted the seasons that pass over your fields. And you would watch with serenity through the winters of your grief. And that brings us to acceptance. This is knowledge as being a goof. I think we have to accept grief. I, we should probably be grieving. But we also have to move past this and we have to look this problem directly in the eye or we'll never uh, be able to come up with a plan until it's too late. Um, I'm not here to propose solutions. I've already run out of my half hour. If anyone else has any other ideas, there are, you have many more years of giving conferences in front of you and I welcome those. Um, this might be the biggest problem in human health. Most people, I'm hedging my bets there. Uh, all the people I know who follow this think it absolutely is without a doubt. And it's, and the hard part is it's going to make everything slightly worse. It's like diabetes. What blood vessel does diabetes hit? It doesn't hit one blood vessel, it hits them all. And that's a problem. Every minor little thing will just get worse and worse and worse. And it'll be a bunch of problems that we already know and that we've already seen, but they're just a little bit different and a little bit more. And that's how you boil the frog couple of takeaways. There's gradual change, but the extreme disasters might be what screw us over. And there's going to, both of them are a problem, but they, but this is part of one of the problems of climate change. It's kind of like how when some people say, well, there's global warming, but it was kind of cold last winter. It's kind of like anec data. If you have one patient where you got away with doing something dumb, it's not the same as um, that being the thing you should actually do. Uh, none, like I said, none of the problems are new. Um, they're all going to be the same old problems. They're all going to get worse and they're all going to intersect with each other. Talking about these problems is a in a meaningful way is the only way to prepare for them. And it's the only way to prepare us for how we respond. Do we want to be brutal in how we look at the world? Do we want to say, well, I want more for me and everyone else can burn and drown? Or do we 
And then also the secret thing, the real reason I gave this talk is that I think if we can deal with this in a meaningful way, it might make us more motivated to act and maybe it'll freak people out. And maybe if, if we talk about it, or we're hanging out with our policy friends or hedge fund friends, maybe we can get people to do a little bit more. Um, when I got into this, it made me more motivated. And I hope that that's better than um, being what the, what the New Yorker and the New York Times and everyone else is called doomerism, where we all just sort of give in and roll over and wait with um, learned helplessness. I think we can at least do a little bit better. Thank you to everyone.